Good evening, everyone. I wish to start with just acknowledging all of those who've gone before us and cleared our path, but especially the Duwamish upon whose land we stand. My name is Sally Wren, and I'm chair of the Diversity Awareness Committee, and thank you all for coming tonight. And we have a wonderful program tonight, and let me just bring it up on my iPad, because my printer did not work today. <laughs> Always new day, new way in the Horizon House. <laughs> okay, Susan Noyes Platt was born and grew up in New York City which means that from early age, she was immense in diversity. She was also e exposed to the art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, her lifelong interest. After many years as a tenured professor at art history, Susan Noyes Platt is currently an independent art historian and freelance art critic and curator. Her first book, Modernism, in the 1920s examines the critical discourse on modern art in the New York art and academic press of the 1920s before the history of modern art was confirmed. Art and politics in the 1930s, modernism, Marxism, Americanism, looks at the interconnection of art and policies during the Depression years. And art and politics now cultural activism at a time of crisis begins with the 1999 and the WTO, we all remember that in Seattle, demonstrations in Seattle and concludes with reference to the BP Gulf oil spill in the spring of 2010. Topics include opposition to war, terrorism, racism, borders, and the violation of the earth. Recently, she has published two collections of her art criticism, Breaking Ground, Setting Our Hearts on Fire, and in process around the world in 25 years. She has lectured on Maya Lin throughout the state with the support of the Inquiring Mind program as well as publishing several reviews in national publications. Those essays appear in two of her critical collections. Tonight, she will be emphasizing Maya Lin's innovative, innovative approaches as she interacted with indigenous cultures, as well as her deep concern with ecology and climate change. And it is with pleasure I introduce our own program chairman <laughs> tonight, Susan Noyles Platt. Susan? Uh, I had an interesting experience today. Oh, thank you all for being here. What a big audience. Wow. I'm very, very proud. And uh, while I'm on the subject, I want to thank all of, hi. You can't hear me. That better? That sounds very loud, but I'll go ahead. Well, I am Susan Noyes Platt, so. <laughs> anyway, so usually when I tell someone I'm talking on Maya Lin, they've never heard of her, and then I say, do you know the Vietnam Memorial? And everybody says yes. Well, today I was having my hair done, as you can see, by my Vietnamese hairdresser, and I said to him, do you know Maya Lin? No. Do you know the Vietnam Memorial? No. And I thought, isn't that interesting? He came here when he was 15. Why would he know the Vietnam Memorial? There's no Vietnamese mentioned anywhere in that memorial. I just thought of that. I thought that was very, very interesting. Uh, anyway, moving on. But as you all, practically all, everybody knows, Maya Lin became famous at the age of two. Mike, Mike, oh dear, oh dear. Mike, yes, uh, uh, Danny's going to be in charge of directing my mic, I can tell. At the age of 22, in, still in art school at Yale, she beat out over 1,600 entries to build the famous Vietnam Memorial. I will, I will return to that 
later. I just wanted to get that right up front so you'd remember. Now, the Confluence Project that I'm talking about today is on the Columbia River. How many of you know, have heard of it before? Oh, oh, quite a few people, good. Good, good, good. Uh, the largest work of land art ever created. It uh, spreads over 450 miles, the whole length of the, oh, the whole length of the Columbia River. I'll get, I'll get this down. So confluence means a lot of different things in the context of the Confluence Project. It means the coming together of rivers, cultures, history, and people. And the rivers, the, I, I have a little bit too much text at the beginning, but we'll live with it. The confluence of the Lewis and Clark core of discovery and indigenous cultures that they encountered, we could put in parentheses, dealt a death blow to, but some of them are still here. The confluence of the Snake, the Sandy, the Willamette, the Yakima, the Umatilla, and the Clearwater with the Columbia River and the Pacific Ocean itself. The confluence of ecology then and now. The confluence of all the cultures that use the Columbia today. So that's a lot of confluences. And it's not even all of them. Hey, Nick, what's happening? Ah, I got it. So before I look at the Confluence Project itself, I'm just going to mention a few major sculptors who worked with land art uh, a little before this monument was built. And the first sculptor is Constantin Brancusi, who's Romanian, who worked in Paris for the first 50 years of the uh, 20th, 20th century. And then Christo, I think you may be familiar with him, and Robert Smithson. So let's see where that goes. Constantin Brancusi made a major monument to the dead who, from World War I. And this is actually just one third of the monument, but I thought it was uh, a, such a stunning piece. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's called Infinity, and it suggests the infinity of the deaths that occur in war, as well as uh, specifically the Romanians. So that's one example. This is Christo. How many of you have heard of Christo? Yeah, oh, you're a well-informed audience. So notice that Christo and Jean-Claude wrapped coast. So it's a physical thing that they stick on the ground. And uh, I, loved it when, I loved it when it was made. But now you look at it with the point of view of Maya Lin, and it isn't quite so great. But at any rate, it's beautiful. And then the third famous land art, Smithsman spiral, spiral Jetty. Have you heard of that one? Uh, fewer people. Um, in Utah, Great Salt Lake, and as probably many of you know, the lake is uh, coming and going, shall we say. And this was in 2002 when it started re-emerging and it was covered with salt. But now there's no lake around it at all. So this is a dramatic transformation caused by nature, which I'm sure that Smithson would be very happy with. But unlike these artists, Maya Lin was trained as an architect. So she creates spaces and not objects. And she's very c concerned with the context of her work, not just a thing. So uh, as we see in the Vietnam Memorial, it's like a slash through the mall. And it's a physical slash but it is in relation to the whole environment. In addition to that, she also has uh, the audience interacting with her sculpture. So here you see someone actually seeing a name of someone that they know. And notice how she, this person is facing the, the uh, monument. The second monument that she created uh, that I'm going to talk about is in Montgomery, Alabama, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, homage to the Civil Rights Movement, and it's a very beautiful piece. Again, she encourages people to touch it. I think that's a bit blurry, so we'll move on quickly. But you get the idea. Um, Maya Lin believes that a connection to nature, this is moving into the ecological side, is an essential component of our humanity. So I'm going to sit on the chair. I really don't think it's a good idea.
make the mic even work. Ice cream cone, I'm going to work. Ice cream cone. But I don't eat ice cream cones like this. <laughs> Myelin believes that a connection to nature is an essential component of our humanity. So here is an example of the kind of environmental work. She's made many pieces like this. This is called the Wave Field, and it's in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Oh, we look at the Columbia River, the mighty Columbia. I wish I had Woody Guthrie playing in the background. That would be terrific. Uh, so this project began in 2000 as part of the commemoration of the Lewis and Clark uh, journey in uh, 1803. But Maya Lin was completely uninterested in commemorating Lewis and Clark. It wasn't in her toolbox. But Native leaders went to New York City to convince her. I, I have this wonderful image in my head of this meeting. Uh, that a monument to their loss, which was a major component of the Lewis and Clark expedition, was what they wanted. And they were inspired by the Vietnam Memorial Monument to Loss. So as a result, she agreed to, to do it. And she, there were seven sites chosen as she toured the Columbia River with John Paul Jones. You'll be hearing more about John Paul Jones. But it's a collaboration with native voices along the entire river, looking at loss and survival for the tribes, as well as an ecological project, looking at loss and restoration of native plants and landscapes. So it has these two different points of view, not really commemorating Lewis and Clark, but they do have a voice. So here are the seven sites along the river. Uh, the first site here is Cape Disappointment that we're going to look at, which is the confluence of the Columbia River and the Pacific Ocean. This one we're not going to talk about. It's major, mainly an educational site. Uh, the third site is the Vancouver Land Bridge, which appeared on the poster. And it's kind of what my piano teacher would call an outlier. But we'll, it's a very important one. The third site here is the confluence of the Sandy River and the Columbia. The fourth site is Celilo Falls, which has a very dramatic story. Has not been built, and I'll tell you why later. And the fifth site is Sacagawea, the confluence of the snake and the Columbia. Very important. Have any of you been to that area? Yeah, yeah, it's very industrialized, right? And then the, the sixth site over here is Chief Timothy's listening uh, amphitheater. We'll get to that one. So one thing to keep in mind is that these Indians were not wiped out. With all our best efforts to wipe out the Indians, they have survived. You know, you know what they are, the reservations, the boarding schools. I don't have to go into it. But we do still have, you see these blue areas, we still have a number of tribal areas and reservations. So they have survived, and I think they're surviving more and more. But we built all of these dams on the Columbia River, which was definitely making it very hard for the salmon, the keystone of their culture, to survive. This, this is the Grand Coulee Dam up here. Right, Henry? He told me. The very top. The very top. This one. Oops, wrong slide. Uh, and uh, you can see how many dams there are. Uh, some of them had a way for the fish to get through but many of them do not. And I'm sure you're aware that there's a big dam removal project going on now. Am I doing okay with this? Okay. So let's look at, ha! Huh, I tried and tried to get this map to face the right way, but see, Henry, it flipped again. Um, anyway, it's sideways. It's all right. Here is Cape Disappointment. Here's the Columbia River, and here's the Pacific Ocean, and the site, there are actually many sites here that she created. This was the first area that she worked on where Lewis and Clark ended their journey. So there's Waikiki Beach, which you'll see in a minute. These, these are some of the sites. The Sacred Circle over here, that's, oh, you can't see that. Fish cleaning sink and the viewing station, sorry. This is the Waikiki Beach area. Interesting it's called Waikiki. 
There were Hawaiians that came all the way from Hawaii to Vancouver. Really interesting. I guess that's why it's called. This is the, the path to the sacred circle. And then you have to, I'll show you another map for the others. OK. So here's Maya Lin looking at the Waikiki Beach, view to the Pacific Ocean. And this is what this environment looked like when she built the path. It's just a, a pile of sand because previously it had been a parking lot. OK, so she moved the parking lot. And uh, here you see more clearly the path and then the inscriptions. I'm going to show you a clearer photo, but just to get the idea of the inscriptions, which are Lewis and Clark, summary statement of the rivers, creeks, and most remarkable places. Their distances from the mouth of the Missouri as high up that river as was explored in the year 1804 by Captain Lewis and Clark. So I read the slide before I showed it to you. So we can move on. Uh, so this is the way they look. Distance from one place to the, to the other. Distance from the mouth of the Missouri, the width of the rivers and creeks, the side of the Missouri on which they are situated. So they were obsessive. Measurers, namers, you know, it was just incredible how rational they were. So here, here is an example. They renamed all the Indian sites with, uh, with, enlightened, with, with new names. So here you have White Paint Creek. And here, you, at least they included the Indian name here. Uh, so these are all some of the planks. There's a lot of planks. Cave to hold the cavern in Osage Women's River. So as my, this is what the site looks like now. It's completely restored uh, the native grasses. And if you look carefully, you can see here the amphitheater. Oh, I'm supposed to use the pointer. Let's see if I can make it work. Pointer's kind of a pain. That's the amphitheater there. And you don't really need a close-up of it. Um, while she was listening to the dedication of Waikiki, I can't get rid of it. Um, she was so inspired by the Chinook blessing words that they gave that she changed the design of the whole thing and added another path. Instead of a linear path with Lewis and Clark, she added a curving path filled with oyster shells and planks which had the blessing uh, terms on it. So there you see the curving path. And this is one example. It says, teach us and show us the way, which is repeated as a refrain on every other plank. But the planks also have a long prayer. We call upon all those who have lived on this earth, our ancestors and our friends, who have dreamed the best for future generations. And upon those lives, our lives are built. And with thanksgiving, we call upon them to teach us and show us the way. So you can imagine why she was inspired by this prayer. I'm going to read one more segment. There's like 10 segments. We call upon the creatures of the fields and the forests and the seas, our brothers and sisters, Lou the wolf, Mulak the elk, Mawich the deer, Chanak the eagle, the great whales and the sturgeon and the salmon people who share our Chinook waters. And we ask that they teach us and show us the way. So. Every plank has this magnificent in invocation. Here's Mylin inspecting the end of the trail here. Uh, and she decided to turn around this giant cedar log. And then when we went back in the summer of 2007, it was all grown over with beautiful vegetation. Here's our plank, here, I mean the stump here. It was a sacred circle because she had brought in some dead trees and made them stand up around it. That doesn't sound very sacred, does it? Anyway, she wanted to have a continuous path between Cape Disappointment and the other sites at, 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 from Waikiki to the other sites. But all of these sites and every part of the Confluence Project had to be negotiated with the state and the federal government and the engineers and the Park Service. Anyway, they said, no, you can't, have a, you can't have a path there. So she went to Baker's Bay, and that's the next site. And here they are dedicating the whole of Cape Discovery 
in April 2006, there's Maya Lin at the podium, and here she is with her, at that time, young girls, with Gary Locke, the governor, at that time, I think he was still governor, maybe he wasn't, not sure when he stopped, and uh, this is Cliff Snyder, one of the uh, native leaders who went to New York City and convinced her to do the project. There was a lot of celebration by the Chinook in a ceremonial garb, and all ages, you have a little boy, you have a baby, you have some young people uh, beating their drums in honor of this event, but at the same time, you had protests. Can an artist be a prostitute for US colonialism? Maya, why do you, oh God, I can't read it. What does it say? Immortalize U.S. theft, and Cais is the Chinook name for Cape Disappointment. So there were quite a few more of these, but that's enough. So it was very interesting to see this division. The Chinook, I believe, are still not a recognized tribe. They were recognized for one day, and then uh, Bush uh, reversed it when he came into office. I'm not sure why. That seems pretty petty, but anyway. Um, am I doing okay with the mic, folks? Not close enough? Can you still hear me in the back row? I don't eat, I don't eat ice cream this way. Anyway, um, the fish cleaning table, which was the centerpiece of this site where they dedicated it, uh, had a creation myth of the Chinook inscribed on the top of this piece of basalt. Ages ago, an old man to looks for the south wind, when traveling to the north, met an old woman named Kutz Hoot, who was a, an ogress and a giantess. He asked her for food when she gave him a net, telling him that she had nothing to eat and he must go and try to catch some fish. He accordingly dragged the net and succeeded in catching a grampus, or as the Indians call it, a little whale. This he was about to cut with his knife when the old woman cried out to him, to take, um, to take a sharp shell and not to cut the fish crossways, but split it down the back. He waited, but he, without giving heed to what she said, cut the fish across the side and was about to take a piece off of the blubber. But the fish immediately changed into an immense bird and flying, when flying completely covered the sun and the noise made by its wings shook the earth. The bird, which they called Hanes, then flew away to the north and lit on the top of the Saddleback Mountain near the Columbia River. Well, there's more to the story, but that's a pretty dramatic story. So here you see someone, of course, cutting the fists properly, right, uh, today. Uh, and here's Maya Lynn with her daughters at the fish cleaning table. I really love this photograph of them. And I think it's so cool that she brought her whole family to this dedication. I think it's the only one where they all came. So you proceed down to the end of this area called the Estuary Viewing Vegetation Restoration. And she has a quote by one of the members of the Corps of Discovery. This morning, the weather appeared to settle and clear off, but the river remained rough. We went about three miles when we came to the mouth of the river where it empties into a handsome bay. And that quote is inscribed on this border piece as you go and look at the bay. So today, the, the path to that area is now regrown and really restored to uh, its uh, natural state. Okay, we're gonna go on to the Vancouver Land Bridge. Are there any questions before I go on? Can you hear me? Am I licking the ice cream enough? Okay. Uh, Vancouver Land Bridge, and I'm providing you with a map to orient you in the real world of where Vancouver is, although you all know, because Portland is right here. Uh, Henry took this picture in March 2007 as the land bridge was under construction, just to give you a sense of the immense amount of uh, work it was. This connected the Vancouver National Historic Reserve and the Columbia River. 
it was the former site of the Klickitat Trail. And this site was a place where Indians came together to trade. It's a 50-foot wide earth-covered bridge. And as John Paul Jones, who's the architect, the land bridge will pick up the floodplain terraces and riparian vegetation and carry these landscapes up and over the highway. So this is the original trail. And this is the original waterfront way back when. And then there was you know, nothing there. And then we had Fort Vancouver build on this plain, which the Indians had cleared for the purposes of this meeting that they had. Uh, they burned off the woods and created open access. But then Fort Vancouver came along. So John Paul Jones designed this extraordinary uh, hook-shaped bridge, and I said already, pulling the prairie over the road. Here you see a cross section as it goes across the highway next to the, um, next to the bridge. I'll get into more detail in a minute. Yeah, thank you, Henry. I asked Henry to interrupt me, so you have to know that this is great. <laughs> Henry said, the point is that you, there was no connection between, let's look at that. Oh, there was no connection. Oh, I should hand it to you. There wasn't a connection between the river and the inland Fort Vancouver. And the purpose of this was to build a, a bridge over the highway and then at the end, they put a tunnel through the railroad. So let me see there. Oh, you can't see that. The lead architect at the dedication of the land bridge wearing his ceremonial cedar headdress. But see, the way it works is here's Vancouver side, and you walk around, and then you come down here, and there's a welcome uh, arch that Lillian Pitt made, and I'll get to that. There is Myelin and her husband walking up that curving path. And see, here's the train. So she's going the opposite way. And there is John Paul Jones. I wanted to show a picture of Jane Jacobson, who was the original uh, coordinator of the Confluence Project and all these sites. And this is Anton Minthorn, the other major native leader who went to New York City to persuade uh, Myelin to create this project. And here is your. Uh, art critic striding across the bridge <laughs> taken by my excellent photographer Henry Matthews who took quite a few of these pictures uh, including this one they had these wonderful uh, see they're being held up with uh, what are they being held up with cables or something uh, and here are the people coming in from Vancouver side racing up the bridge on the day of the opening and at the end of the bridge they come to this beautiful uh, welcome gate honoring canoe cultures, and this is Lillian Pitt's uh, glass sculpture uh, welcoming people. John Paul Jones, there's your intrepid art critic. I'm in a lot of these pictures. I'm not shy. Um, Lillian Pitt, the fabulous Native American uh, sculptor, who, by the way, is having a one-person show in Seattle in August at the Stonebridge Gallery. So you'll be able to see some of her work. And she's a, I, I don't know if she's coming or not. So here she is. These are, these are little observation um, areas at three points on the bridge. And uh, you see this is based, based on a pictograph. So I just wanted to show you the environment that these pictographs came from. This is uh, along the Columbia River. Uh, and uh, it's near the Dalles. Here is. Shagalal, she who watches, near vantage, excuse me. And uh, either Henry or I took this picture, we're not sure who, but it's a very dramatic, beautifully preserved pictograph. And her work, in, oh, I meant to wear the earring she made that I had. Oh, well, never mind. Um, she uses this motif in a lot of her work. And then you also see these kinds of pictographs. There are many of them. Oh, sorry. So here is the bench with the pictographs. And each of these, uh, they're round, circular lookouts. Um, there's your intrepid art critic again. <laughs> and then there's the aspect of restoring the native, uh, the native uh, plants and flowers. 
So you can see that even by the time of the opening, uh, there, there was a lot of native plants that had grown up. This is the uh, area where those benches are, and it's called an observation deck. I want to mention that there's a recent book about the Confluence Project by this excellent art historian named Matthew Reynolds, and uh, it's fairly expensive. I don't think I'm, I may donate it to the library. Sally wants me to donate it. But he had access to all the eye curves and all the study stages and all sorts of, of different ideas. And he said, which I didn't know, that Maya Lin took this off of her website because she didn't feel ownership of this particular uh, bridge. And I think we can see why. Because her whole thing is having very subtle intervention in the landscape. And this is a giant, enormous, engineered bridge. So interesting, isn't it? They collaborated, but I think that she um, missed, lost out on what was to be done. The other thing to mention is you saw the shape of it. It was like a fish hook. So, no, not a fish hook. How would you describe that shape, architectural people? It was sort of like this. Very hard to engineer, right? Uh, a curved bridge. Okay, so it, it took a long time to create. So what she did was she carried the, land, the landscape across the, the road and the railway. Yeah, and that's... I've, vegetation. Yes, thank you, Henry. You should have a mic. I only have one. Are there more mics around? Give Henry a mic so whenever he says something, you can hear it. Okay, so we're going to go on to the next site which is the Sandy River Delta, which is the most focused on ecology. It's a bird viewing platform, but it really isn't. You'll see why I said that. And it has birds, it has words that speak to what Lewis and Clark recorded, not only birds, but also flora and fauna, and the restoration of the landscape. So again, I have this sort of funky looking map that I don't know why it has all these wiggly lines, but Sandy River Delta is a little further up the Columbia River from Vancouver. And uh, here is a map that shows you, uh, that's it there. Um, and I know you can't read this, but I, it, it's a reminder for me. They went up the Sandy River and it didn't go anywhere. They thought it would be something they could explore, but it was a dead end. And here you see it as a dead end when they started work on this project. So uh, this shows you uh, the dedication. <laughs> Here I am again with Maya Lin. <laughs> Henry, how'd you catch that one? <laughs> um, and then you have, oh, there I am. OK, I keep looking at the next slide and thinking you can see it. Uh, the bird blind, as you know, is normally used for hunters to look through it in order to kill things, or hunting bump blind, or whatever it is. But this bird blind uh, has incised, as I said, I don't know if you can read this, even this close, but it shows the species when they were viewed by Lewis and Clark and their extinction or their continued existence. So you, here's Maya Lynn pointing at this bird blind. Oops, sorry, I did that again. Here's Maya Lynn pointing at the bird blind, okay? and people have to get up really close. Um, so remember the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that the interaction with the piece, not only the environment it's in, but our interaction with it is a key aspect of Myelin's work. And I forgot to mention that in the Cape Disappointment site, you're looking down at the work. You're walking on it, very different from the Vietnam Memorial where you're looking at it this way. So in each of her works, she creates a dynamic between us and the piece. It's very important to her. OK, we're moving along. Good. Uh, the, the next site is the one that is very, very sensitive. Celilo Falls, here it is. Uh, Celilo Village. And uh, it was never, it hasn't been completed because it was such a painful sight for native tribes. When the Celilo Falls were silenced by the Dalles Dam in 1957, 
It's been continuously inhabited for 12,000 years. Yam is the name of the falls, and that means echo of falling water. So here you see the fishing sites. There were dozens of them around the falls before they all disappeared in 1957. And here you see the Indians and their extraordinarily complicated ways of fishing. It was like acrobatics for them to reach into these falls and grab the fish. But they each had, let me go back to the other side, they each had rights to one of these sites, uh, inherited rights. So it was a very organized thing. So I have a quote to you. This, isn't, this is on the John Day Dam, not on the Celilo Falls, but it could apply to any of these. This power is very important to you. This power is like food to you. The water that is making this power provides you with all the food you need. Your power and my power are two different things. The things that I am showing outside the teepees, that is the food we Indians were provided with. That food will take care of us. That food will make me strong and healthy. It is our medicine. So the perspective is that their native food that grows and they gather is what they eat rather than the power that creates all of our food, which is not necessarily natural. While the fishing sites were operating for thousands and thousands of years, uh, the family that lived in Celilo Falls was able to choose, was able to assign and relocate fishing rights. And this is Tommy Thompson, the last of those chiefs who had the sad duty of moving the whole village uh, out of the way of the dam. Well, if you go there today, you see this. It says a U.S. government property, fishing rights only for certain tribes, and then they have these fishing nets. But uh, it, you know, <laughs> it's hard to get the fish. So Salila Falls had two blessing ceremonies. The first weekend they had Indians from all over the Northwest came and grieved for the loss of the falls. And that was not open to anybody. The second weekend, which is the one I went to, was a blessing procession with many native leaders participating. And here's some of them. This is a spiritual leader of Warm Springs Reservation, Fred Wallaluam. Anton Minthorn, you've heard of him before as one of the leaders of the Confederate tribes and brought Myelin in. And here she is taking a minor part. She was purposely not being prominent. And then I was impressed with this young woman who is the chairwoman of the Nez Perce Tribal Council. Pretty young, anyway. So the question was, how do you commemorate such a great loss? Here's the fishing, and here's the monument design, here's the river. And the answer was, it was not possible. So there is no uh, Myelin project there. She respected their desire to agree to what would happen, and they, they didn't like any of the ideas, so they're leaving it. Okay, am I going too fast? Are you with me? Is the microphone in the right place? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sacagawea State Park. It's near the Tri Cities, right? Is that it? What are they called, the Tri Cities? No, no, there's three cities there. What? Are they? What? Yakima, is it? No. Not Yakima. He's shaking his head, no. Pasco, that's the key name, yeah. Pasco, blah, blah, blah. Kennewick. Kennewick, Pasco. Richmond. 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 Richland. Yeah, very industrialized cities, very industrialized. So she was working with Sacagawea State Park, which you see the confluence of the Snake and the Columbia here, right? At that, it's a major confluence. We don't see that. Oh. oh now we do. That's right, here it is. Sorry. <laughs> You've got to call me out on that, Deborah. I keep pointing at the slide you can't see. <laughs> Okay, there is the, there is the site right there, the Snake and the Columbia. And here is the Snake River. At that site, there already was a pioneer monument and the Sacagawea Museum, which I have not been inside of, but probably honoring Sacagawea, who was crucial to the success of the Lewis and Clark mission. And some people say they would have all died without her. 
Uh, so that was what was there. And what Maya Lin decided after several revisions was to do these very unobtrusive story circles that have uh, inscribed in them uh, the various functions of this area. It was a meeting place, again, like Vancouver uh, Project near the Klickitat Trail, of, of Indians who met and stay there all summer, trading and visiting and socializing. So see how unobtrusive that is compared to the land bridge. And I really love this picture with Maya Lin listening to a drumming ceremony here. And uh, the, uh, the next slide is very hard to see. You just have to take my word for it. This inscribes the various um, animals and flowers and other things that were there at the time of 10,000 years, wild onion and grouse and things like that. Uh, this one in, is inscribed about the long house, and this one is the rivers before the dam. So this is a very in, unobtrusive, uh, slow monument. And Matthew, who wrote this great book, makes a point of the sonic dimension of Maya Lin's work, which I hadn't thought about at all. In other words, this is a quiet piece. This is a place to sit and contemplate. But it's immediately next to all these industrial areas that you have to pass through to get there. And that juxtaposition of our development of the land compared to the native sustaining of the land is one of the themes of these pieces. And then the last site is all about sound. There's Chief Timothy listening circle. Now this was supposed to be in Lewiston Clarkston because that is obviously the confluence. Which one is it? Oh, I've forgotten. Anyway, I told you at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, but they couldn't put it there because there were a lot of big box stores right at the confluence. What is that river? Somebody must know. Come on, you do. Snake. The what? Snake. Are that still the snake? Yeah. Okay, we'll go with that. Um, it's an amphitheater, an ecological trail, and restoration. So, oh, I did the same thing again, didn't I? I'm sorry. I keep looking at this little slide here and talking about it. Now we can see, can't we? You think it's a snake? This is, this is a snake. The question is, what's that? Somebody's answering. Somebody knows. Oh, it's still the snake. But then that's not a confluence. All right. So then we'll move on. From this site, you see these basalt cliffs. And it was referred to by as the place where the waters meet. And Chief Timothy, the chief of the Lapawai encampment of the Nez Perce Indians, was the person that was sort of in charge of this area in terms of historical events. So Maya Lin created an even more understated monument not a monument, a series of circles that create an amphitheater, very natural amphitheater within this landscape. And uh, Matthew talks about the silence of this site because it's far away from industrial development. And <clears throat> at the time of the dedication, you see the, these are some of these same historical figures. This is Horace Axel who became uh, a He's an elder, elder, and I think he, he has died now, but he was a very good friend of Maya Lin's. And then here you see the people gathering uh, at the dedication. They had the okay, now I can take no, it. The this is the site, and then they're going to show you what happened at the which I couldn't. We all we are gathered on sacred ground. Ten years ago, Nez Perce elders, many of whom are here today, that came to bless this place. Can you hear it? Finally, through persistence, patience, and perseverance, and with the help of a whole lot of people, the Confluence Listening Circle is here. We are gathered in Nez Perce homelands. 
The Namipu have always been here, and they will always be here when all of us individually are long gone. And today we honor the Nez Perce people and pay respect and say thank you for welcoming us here. It was beautiful to hear the words of seven generations and seven generations yet to come because that is what we live for as Indian people, as Nimipus, as the Sahaptin family, that there will be something that we can pass on to our children and ensure that tomorrow our children will have the same opportunities that we have to pass on the old songs of our people. <laughs> Park is the only confluence project that still resembles what Lewis and Clark saw 200 years ago. This listening circle is an amphitheater made of locally found basalt. The shape is directly inspired by the Nez Perce blessing ceremony performed here in the spring of 2005. If we could look at this place, reflect back in time, not just 200 years but deeper, but look at it from the different cultures that have lived here as well as the ecological history of these places. That is one thing we always try to do is remember our ancestors. When you honor your ancestors, you honor yourself. That's one thing we always keep in mind. Today we know that they are standing here. They are sitting here with us. Those from generations ago And they are listening to our words, words that we know come from the heart. This is a time for us to be here and to be with us all together. Thank you very much. So that gives you much more of a sense of it than my slides. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is Maya Lynn grew up in Ohio. So they had mound builders in Ohio. So she, at an early age, may have been exposed to this idea of Native Americans using of the land and invented in the land. But she didn't have a clue about the rich indigenous heritage of the Columbia River Basin. And at the very beginning, you may remember that I said, she heard the Chinook blessing and she changed the design of the first site. So that was her first being affected by the, oh, of course she was affected in New York City because they convinced her to come. But then as she went from site to site, I think she became more and more humble in her relationship to the indigenous people. And they respected her more and more. She wasn't some outside person coming in. And so, this ceremony, I think, suggests a kind of a, a, a summation of the new understanding of Native cultures. They played a major part in this ceremony. You see very brief comment by the head of the Confluence Project and everything else. Everyone else is a Native voice. So I think that was a very, very important aspect of Maya Lin's uh, having a response to these I also want to mention that the uh, Confluence Project is going on with a major educational program. They have programs in the schools, they have programs, this is an art project at Celilo Falls where the children made, whoops, there I go again, small tiles <laughs> and uh, inserted them and they have dozens of summer programs where the children go and experience these sites as well as adults and there's a huge educational program too. So the Confluence Project continues to reach out to people with indigenous history, and they have a many indigenous teachers involved in the project. So I think you know, it's, it's a long way from that early start as a commemoration of Lewis and Clark. But at the same time, it still recognizes the importance of sustaining indigenous cultures today and spreading the information about indigenous cultures today. So, uh, her philosophy, each of my works originates from a simple desire 
to make people aware of their surroundings, not just the physical world, but also the psychological world. I do not choose to overlay personal commentary on historical facts. I'm interested in presenting factual information and allowing viewers the chance to come to their own conclusions. I create places in which to think without trying to dictate what to think. I seek to create an intimate dialogue with the viewer to allow a place of contemplation. So I'll end with that wonderful thought by Maya Lin. And it's in one of these books here that I brought in. And I also have her in, I covered the Confluence Project in two of my own books, uh, which I've brought. And these are in the library. I did a little reading. Is Nancy here, Nancy Cope? No, well, anyway. Yay, there she is. She invited me to read, so I read a little bit of the Confluence Project, if you remember. And then there's two other books by, about Maya Lin, and there's also a traditional study of Lewis and Clark, which is actually quite interesting because it includes their maps and their measurements and their naming and all of those things that they do. At the very beginning, while you were coming in, I, I was showing you a little bit of the What is Missing website, and for some reason I couldn't get it to work. But do remember that and go up to your home computers and look at it. It's astonishing. It's about extinctions. And Maya Lin's obsession is stopping extinction. So climate change and the sixth mass extinction is her focus. Okay, questions. Sally has a question. Oh, do we? Yes, first of all, thank you. I made a few mistakes with the screen, but you got the idea. Okay. Susan? A question. Susan? Who's talking? Over here. Okay. Bill, jump this in ahead of you just a minute. Bill. I have a question. Um, these sites, like this Chief Thomas site, is there an organization that maintains this property, or is it Indian tribes, or who is maintaining the well, property? That, this Chief Timothy? Yeah. That's a really good question, because I think it's the only one that's not state-owned land or federal land. And uh, I, I don't know who's maintaining it. The tribes aren't maintaining it. So I have to find out. But I did read that it doesn't have the same jurisdiction as all the others. It, very good question. You just landed on that one, didn't you? Wow. Count on Bill. OK. Over here. Um, this is enormous, and I didn't know anything about it, so I have so many questions. But a major question is, how was this funded? Oh, at the beginning, they had a great many uh, grants, and they had a lot of funding from the state and uh, federal grants to create the project. Um, since the Celilo Falls was never created, they had this chunk of money to use for the educational programs. But they, of course, they're doing fundraising all the time, like everybody else in the world. So naturally, there's also ongoing donations. Yeah. If you have 10 questions, you can ask another. <laughs> Is there someone else? If we want to give, what do we do? If you want to what? Give. Oh, go to the website, <laughs> www. Is I didn't put it up there. Confluence. No, what is missing is Maya Lynn's website. Let me see. Didn't I have the other website? Oh. There it is. Confluence Project. Just, this, is a, this is the uh, dedication video. But if you just go to confluenceproject.org, I'm sure they have a donation place. But I'm not fundraising. <laughs> I'm just talking. She said she had 10 questions. Do we deprive her of the chance to ask a second? You don't want to? I'm dying to know what they are. OK, anybody else? Henry, ask a question. Sally wants to end, but I want Henry. You must have a question. Come on, Henry. Henry helped me prepare the PowerPoint. Very, very helpful. <laughs> well, why don't why don't we go back to several of them quite soon? Ah, yes. We were very fortunate that we got to
how many dedications? Four, de five dedications. We went to five of the dedications. You saw the pictures that I took. And we w went to some of the early planning stages too. Well, I showed that slide that you took with the crazy. Well, you know, now that I think about it, the bridge doesn't fit in at all. It's an earthwork, just like Robert Smithson. Well, don't you think? Well, I think the, uh, the original idea, there had been this trail leading from many places and coming to down to the river where the Indians met and traded. And then this was blocked by a freeway and a road. And it seems a very legitimate uh, thing to, to overcome that barrier and in designing a bridge to make the landscape go over, not just people. Uh, the bridge on either side of the bridge are, are native plants. That's a very good so rebuttal. I'm, I, I'm not accepting any kind of criticism of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sally, you want to... It's 8.30. I have to stop. We want to give Susan... Oops. We, we wish to give Susan another great applause for a wonderful, wonderful program. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. And I would like to close with um, an, Apache, an Apache prayer. May the sun bring you new energy by day. May the moon softly restore you by night. May the rain wash away your worries. May the breeze blow new strength into your being. May you walk gently through the world and know its beauty all the days of your life. Thank you again for your attendance.